Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this new virtual dialogue organized by EADI. We are very happy today to have Dr. Susanna Salou from the University of Leeds, from the Sustainability Research Institute. The SRI at the University of Leeds is our latest member. They recently joined a few months ago, and we are very happy about that. And we would like to give a warm welcome to all of you today who are joining us from Leeds. My name is Basil and I work at the EADI Secretariat. We are the European Association for Development Research and Training Institutes. And we work towards improving the visibility of development studies and international development studies at the European level and beyond. Our talk today uh, will be about consistent injustice within environment development intervention, with insights from Sub-Saharan Africa and ways forward. Susanna Salou has a master's in environmental technology from Imperial College and a PhD in geography from Oxford. She's currently working as Associate Professor of Environment and Development at the SRI at Leeds. And she's an interdisciplinary researcher whose research focuses broadly on human environment interactions and more specifically on rural livelihoods, environmental change, marginalization and natural resource governance. She has expertise on Sub-Saharan Africa with a particular focus on Tanzania, where she has worked for many years now. Susanna, thank you very much for joining us. And in terms of the format, you will have about 25 minutes to do your presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A and discussion session. If you do have questions, I would encourage everyone to keep them for the end for the discussion. And you can write them here in the chat and I can compile them as a list for the discussion session. Without further ado, the floor is yours, Susanna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for inviting me. And it's great to be here and to represent the, and one of the new partners um, within the network. Today I'm going to sort of discuss consistent injustice within environment and development intervention and particularly in the context of empirical work we've been doing in Tanzania. But what I want to do first is, is sort of go through some of the high level insights that are coming out of current systematic review on resilience that I'm collaborating with a large team of researchers on to sort of situate why then I'm talking about consistent injustice as a means of opening up discussion on this issue to try and find ways forward for programming in, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. So just to put this, the, the talk into context, there's multiple, a multitude of socioeconomic and environmental impacts as a result of the escalating anthropogenic drivers of global and local change and rapid transformation of social ecological systems that are increasingly exacerbated by climate change, which ultimately are adding burden, especially among those most dependent on natural resources for their livelihoods. So with, with ever increasing pressures, there is increasing pressure for more sustainable and resilient systems and to design futures that are more sustainable and resilient. And there is an increasing pace and scale of action being called for with only just recently, you know, the U Adaptation Action Coalition being um, announced by the UK government. You know, the campaigns, the Race for Resilience campaign are just examples of the calls to action in this era and the need for transformation, not just in terms of how we govern systems, but, but in terms of potentially development practice. So, and that is particularly because there's increasing recognition of the need to consider justice dimensions within resilience and transformation debates. But this will really require a lot of attention and further discussion and research on the processes of how we achieve resilience or sustainability, as well as the focus on outcomes, for example, achieving a resilient livelihood. And you know, here I've, I've got a quote talking about resilience as a process of negotiation, a recent you know, paper by Harris and Gina Zogovel in, in South Africa, who talk about resilience as a process of negotiation. So really what I'm trying to stimulate today is a thinking around 
resilience as a process, not just as, a, as an outcome. An iterative process, perhaps, of engagement with the diverse actors' interests and action across time and governance scales. And I also draw on Svarstad and Benjaminson's recent paper, Reading Radical Environmental Justice Through a Political Ecology Lens, who have knitted together very nicely in a paper the sort of the environmental justice and political ecology framings. And certainly when thinking about what I'm talking about today, these ideas are very helpful in sort of trying to organize our thinking. And we think about environmental justice through three dimensions. Increasingly, others are incorporating issues of capabilities and arguing that we need to think about power, the heterogeneity of communities, and also the underlying structures of injustice and contextuality. But if we think about the three dimensions of environmental justice put forward by Schlossberg, you know, procedural justice would be who is involved and has influence in terms of decision making. Distributive justice, the distribution of burdens and benefit related to environmental interventions, and justice as recognition, who is given respect or not, and whose interests, values and views are recognised and taken into account. And this speaks to decolonisation, debates, thinking about senses of justice, the, which, you know, the subjective perceptions, evaluation and narration of, of different ideas, interests and values. So what I want to do first is, is just provide some high, really high level initial insights from some of the analysis I personally have been involved in within a big project um, which has been undertaking a systematic review of more than 202 English written papers between 2015 and 2020 that focus on resilience and resilience processes. This is a World Universities Network project that's led by Petra Shaka in the University of Western Australia, involving more than 15 colleagues across the globe from 13 institutions and in nine countries. So this is a global, uh, has a global, global relevance. And the key question we've been asking in, in the analysis of this work is how are power and resilience negotiated in the context of climate change adaptation, food and livelihood security and so societal transformation? across geographic cultural contexts and across levels of spatial scale. And we've been applying this concept of negotiated resilience to help us think about resilience and to try and dig into the processes of negotiation that are ongoing within these processes. And ultimately what we're doing here is, is trying to work out what we know, what we don't know, and where further academic attention is required and how that academic work needs to be conducted so the methodologies behind it. So just to flag this is very much work in progress and I'm just reflecting on the insights from the aspects of the work I've been involved in in terms of the analysis and it is very very much high level sort of simplified um, high level findings just to situate uh, some of the empirical discussion from, from Tanzania. So when we look at the papers and, and the subjects of resilience that they're looking at, human communities, citizens and residents form the vast majority of the papers in terms of the discussion around resilience. So the focus is really on human communities, citizens and residents of, amongst the, the academic literature in this space. Commodities, sectoral issues, energy, agri-food, water, forestry all feature, but you know, in, in terms of focus to a lesser extent. Cities, of course, feature as well as rural environments. But it's, it's really, this is just flagging up that human community systems and residents are, are the key sort of subject of, of study. When we look at the nature of resilience processes or negotiation processes at the top level, the majority of the papers, or certainly, you know, 65 of the papers are predominantly talking about top-down processes. 31 of the papers talk about government-led processes. Um, participation is obviously mentioned in that, but to a lesser extent, bottom-up driven processes or traditional cultural processes are being discussed. And of course, external agents and, and 
international non-governmental organizations are also being discussed. So as a sort of overview, top-down level processes seem to be a priority, which then doesn't, it's not surprising to see that competing priorities and interests are often pitched against local communities or local people, local citizens, with competing priorities and interests across the papers. The coding for that tends to bring out contestation between international or national governments and local people, project experts and local people, local governments and local people, <laughs> businesses, planners and local people, and within communities, those between educated and less so, or the vulnerable or marginalized or uneducated. So when we look at very high level sort of trends in the literature about winners and losers and noting that it, whilst a bin, you know, binary notion of, of winners and losers is very easily critiqued and I would critique it straight away because we know that there's multiple intersecting inequalities. If we look at the high level sort of codes that are coming out, the winners tend to, unsurprisingly, because the majority of resilience building processes seem to be top down in, in creation, the winners tend to be the government, those leading the processes, the government, the state, but also the, benef the proposed beneficiaries, potentially the local communities are also benefiting. And that's important to say. But when you look at the losers, you do tend to see the, across the papers, marginalized communities is being mentioned as the more marginalized within communities is being losing out and similar numbers of local communities losing as benefiting. When you look at within community uh, data, the vast majority of papers that are talking about winners talk about elites or those with social power, political power. Both men and women are being discussed in relatively equal number. But when you look at who's losing out within the communities, within resilience building processes, women you know, really do feature alongside the poor, smallholder farmers, indigenous people, and in some cases, the youth. So none of this is particularly surprising for those of you working in this type of field. But when we start to look at why, why those winners and losers, assets, wealth, capabilities and position, status, all featured as important characteristics, those with assets, access to resources, capabilities and status benefiting over those lacking such. So over those who are more part, poor, marginalised or disadvantaged. Resistance was an interesting feature in the data set with the willingness and ability to challenge being mentioned in 10 papers connected to a win outcome, with those more fearful of resistance being mentioned as losing out in one of the papers. And gender disparities or inequality tended to, to lead to loss outcomes, particularly seen amongst women. When thinking about why and thinking about processes leading to win-loss outcomes. This is very high level and actually part of the analysis that is being done in this project is really digging into these aspects. The first is top-down expert-driven processes, exclusive process where some are not invited and processes where the needs of the vulnerable were not included were associated with loss outcomes and explain why communities are losing out. And this has been contrasted within the literature with bottom-up participatory and co-production processes allowing local, including those more marginalised, indigenous, women, youth, disabled, the narratives of development to become, to be considered alongside those experts associated with win outcomes. And when, and certainly across the papers, there is discussion about the redistribution of power and resources being recognized as a feature of resilience building. But the data suggests that both win and loss outcomes are very differently distributed. And this is kind of what I'm trying to get at with some of the empirical work that we're looking at. Because there's trade-offs between building resilience of a system, uh, you know, perhaps at a landscape scale, uh, or building a the resilience of an individual or a household. Um, and 
Eviction, displacement and relocation in all circumstances features as a loss. And the governance context very much features in the back as a background structure affecting process, process and win and loss outcomes. And for example, the ability to, to resist something. And so it is highly contextual. Just lastly, from the review, thinking about trade-offs, the key features that tended to feature across the papers, the, first, the, most, sort of the biggest one that featured really was labour. And secondly, control of natural resources, the need to devolve power over particular resources, perhaps for conservation, to, to negotiate on values and to compromise. And, oh, sorry, <laughs> I have just not the slides. Let me just take us back. <laughs> Apologies. Um, and yeah, so I think labour, devolving power and, and land and values is, is something I'll come back to in relation to the empirical work. So now I want to just kind of draw on some empirical work that myself and a, a suite of PhD students at Leeds and a postdoc at Leeds have been working on over many years. The first is a, a GCC, a Global Climate Change Alliance Integrated Approaches for Climate Change Adaptation Project, which was implemented in the Easters and Boroughs by Ongawa, the Tanzania Forest Conservation Group and a district council between 2015 and 2019. The Red Pilot Project in Kilosa, implemented by the Tanzania Forest Conservation Group in Jamita, a network CBO of, of those involved in community forest management between 2009 to 2014, and the Equitable Payment for Watershed Services Project in the Uluguru Mountains, implemented by CARE and WWF 2008 to 2012. Now, all these projects, as you'll see, were developed with a, a justice dimension, dimension integral within the design of the project. In the case of the GCCA project, inclusion of the most vulnerable to climate change and particularly women, the equitable financial incentives uh, for, for supporting village forest reserve establishment and forest conservation in the context of the RED project, and the equitable payments for watershed services for soil and water conservation in the Uluguru's. All the projects were designed and led by conservation and development NGOs uh, with international donor funding. And the role of the researcher in, in terms of the research that was conducted was largely peripheral, external to the project, feeding insight into the project in certain circumstances during the implementation. But the large majority of the analysis was conducted post projects. And at, well, at this stage, I have to acknowledge that the projects have had a very positive impacts in the context of Tanzania and, and the communities engaged in a huge number of ways benefiting large numbers of people in terms of livelihood diversification and the provision of agriculture extension services in particular. But what I want to focus on today is drawing out some of the consistent injustices that continue to perpetuate in terms of project design, implementation and evaluation. And ultimately, these are, are largely dictated by the structures that remain in place in terms of getting funding for, for these types of projects in these contexts. And so what I'm trying to do here is open up conversation about how the development of these projects might be re reimagined and the role of research within that. So this is just to flag the numbers of, of researchers that have been involved, Emmanuel Cuello, Kate Massarella, Robin Loveridge, Harriet Smith, Marta Garowick, Michael Zenia, and uh, Nico Favretto. I'm referring to all the, these guys' work. So this is really a team effort, largely implemented by these students and postdoctoral researchers on the ground. And all these researchers undertook work using mixed methodologies across the papers, the large majority of them incorporated both quantitative and qualitative analysis. Almost all of them, some ethnographic work was conducted to support more quantitative evaluation. 
type work. Except for Kate Massarella, whose work on the RED project was largely qualitative, but using mixed methods. If we break it down in terms of thinking about procedural um, distribution and recognition, the vast majority of the papers sort of engage with one or other of these concepts. And so I wanted to sort of just synthesize what we've been finding on the ground that can very much connects to what we're seeing in the resilience literature from that systematic review, which is in some ways a concern because it suggests that these issues are not just specific to, to these Tanzanian con, con, uh, case study contexts, but more of a, a, a structural problem that needs conversation and, and opening up. So in terms of procedural, the vast majority of these projects were tended to be top down in design with consultation within the communities and consent gained. In some cases, in some villages, the projects were rejected, but in others they were accepted and the project welcomed in those areas. In the context of the adaptation projects in the East Eastern boroughs, a relatively limited vulnerability assessment was conducted at the beginning of the project to try and get a better sense of vulnerability, but actually it was largely unused in terms of determining participants in the project. But there was a specification that 50% of the participants needed to be women with the assumption that they are more vulnerable uh, to the impacts of climate change, but also to ensure some form of gender uh, sensitivity within the project. In terms of implementation across the projects, there were various approaches to participant selection within the programmes. In the GCCA, put in the adaptation project, participant selection was voluntary, but also specified in terms of there needing to be a certain proportion of, of participants from vulnerable or groups or, or from women. And, but the, the process for in, engaging in the projects, of course, went through the village community governance structures, which then leads to some concern over nepotism and the, the potential for elite capture within the groups. And as Harriet sort of mentions in her, in her paper that's in review at the moment, membership formation of groups is central to their functioning. And certainly that's been found across. So whoever, whoever participates really affects the functioning of those groups. In terms of the Payment for Ecosystem Service project and the RED project, the incentives that went into the projects were equally distributed, but also in some cases village payments were, were provided in terms of particularly where trust within the communities exist. But where there wasn't trust within the community, the community benefits were not, were not agreed to. The sustainable light, uh, land management practices were, formed the basis of the condition for payments in the, in the payment for ecosystem service projects. Whereas in the adaptation projects, agricultural inputs were, were used as incentives and community infrastructure programs, building of clinics in some projects or a storage facility for spice marketing were produced in, in some of the projects. And, but these incentives obviously had interesting dynamics in terms of who benefits and who, who didn't. And there's a quote from, from Kate's work from one of the villages where the trust wasn't necessarily within the community that today people embezzle money, nobody does anything. They just tell you what we got so and so from these projects, but there's nothing to show. They just fatten only themselves. He was referring to some of the village leaders. So the, the, you know, the concerns about elite capture, you know, perpetuate through the narratives. And finally, in terms of evaluation, Kate's work really flags this, her recent paper on evaluation. The dominance of quantitative measures can only capture so much information and that the nature of um, evaluations and how they're framed very much affects what is reported in terms of who benefits and, and any unintended consequences within the projects. 
But the dominance of quantitative methods really sort of limits our learning abilities within, within evaluation. When thinking about recognition, dominant conservation and, and sort of technocratic nature of these projects, particularly the payment for ecosystem service project or the, the RED project, the conservation and technocratic discourse running through the projects really affected project framing, design and monitoring and evaluation. And the sort of projects narrowly and technically framed, despite whilst the, the, the projects were narrowly and technically defined, despite the narratives within the communities of the challenges and concerns they have as being really multiple and significantly more complex. So you have this challenge of simplicity or, or, or sort of narrowly defined projects, but then a really very complex situation of interactions going on within the communities. Agendas and interests of the donor and implementing organisations were of course dominant in the narratives articulated in the project documentation, but also in training courses and may in some cases have overwhelmed local priorities. The powerful environmental conservation agendas and interests also acted to mutually reinforce narratives of degradation and scarcity, which inevitably lead to certain types of adaptation being implemented and you know, has the tendency to lead to the promotion of blueprint technologies, climate smart agriculture, watershed conservation, forest conservation enterprises in the, in the context of these projects because forest conservation NGO was, was um, leading in, in several of the projects. And finally, the role of project evaluation in the, the proliferation of that dominant conservation discourse, of course, the evaluation documents that similarly technically defined, linked to the program objectives, defined in some ways by the donor. Um, and those standard evaluations ultimately are checking that the goals of the project have been achieved, but less so what else was achieved or what outside of those strict structures and log frames, which would include additional benefits of the project that might be un un not known about, but also learning about procedure and process and, and learning about unintended consequences and how they emerged and how they might be prevented in future. So Kate, one of Kate's quotes, the evaluation report does not explore these polarized voices with negative project evaluations largely not recognized was one of the concerns that her work sort of flagged up to. And in terms of distribution, if we think back to the systematic review and the outcomes of that, we certainly see differentiated experiences, outcomes and impacts, and them being highly contextual. Um, the impacts of the bylaws, a conservation strategy to prevent people planting vegetables in the riverine areas, for example, actually undermined a, a drought safety net, particularly affecting women who um, gain benefits from, from that process you know, wasn't something that necessarily was recognised at the beginning and, and caused some problems within the adaptation project. The ability and willingness to take risk really affected participation and sustainability of the interventions, particularly because many of all of the projects really were pilot projects. And ultimately, expect, you know, there was some expectation, particularly in the agricultural interventions for experimentation and to just in the bottom right corner there you can see one of the terraces that was promoted which ultimately requires some you know some time to sustain itself assets were also key to to benefit so those with finances who could afford and sustain the technologies who could pay into village savings and loan associations that were established to support the sustainability of the interventions those with land were able to benefit uh, more than those without because many of the activities were agricultural for example within the PES project and within the, the adaptation project. The need for labour was important to be able to, so having large households or people who could attend meetings, attend the training and labour in terms of the, the labour intensity that the terracing for example in this case um, entailed 
having some education and having a mobile phone really affected people's ability to participate in these projects and sustain their activities within the project so they could hear about the meetings and continue to sustain those those networks the co-benefits in terms of the payment for ecosystem service project were actually significantly more important than the payments themselves which actually ended up being very, really quite low when distributed across individuals and these co-benefits included you know increases in productivity of land increasing values of land as a consequence of increasing productivity which ultimately affected land availability for those renting land with the landless in the communities and their food security because it became more productive more more beneficial to those with land to actually farm their land and benefit from the co-benefits that were coming from the increased productivity but also it, the price price rise in land led to people not being able to afford the rent the rent increase so what you see across all the projects is actually you know imp significant improvements for some people but inequality increases particularly where those unable to participate or sustain participation within the project is affected so widen disparity between participants and non-participants to receive agriculture extension support was a bit of an issue in one of the communities with all the extension services tied up in the project and um, one person said i used to call the extension officer for advice but he is too busy now in the farmer field school <laughs> and not able to visit so these are the types of issues that are consistently seen across all of the projects and certainly resonate with the systematic review that so it's not a it turns in an only problem and certainly not a problem just for these projects it's a wider wider issue for these programs so what are the ways forward for programming well in terms from lessons from practice there's a recent special issue just gone out and um, we're just finalizing the editorial for that talks you know that's that's framed around multi-stakeholder collaboration for lands in landscape governance and and management and these are the sort of lessons learned from practice statements that are coming out none of them will be surprising co-design and co-produce you know much more engagement with the local communities on designing these projects rather than them being so top down in design and, and technically framed build on what already exists absolutely in most of the project context they were building on what already existed but certainly the co-design and co-production could could be increased if the resources were available from the, the development partners to do such things. Acknowledge the role of history and context. Find neutral convener, be transparent and open. Widen the net of participants. Use emerging tools and approaches. And certainly we've got work going on to think about what those emerging tools and approaches are, particularly in terms of multi-stakeholder partnerships and, and social innovation. Development, develop agency capacity and trust and build common and inclusive knowledge. And if we th think about it from a, from, from, if I think about it from my perspective, in terms of programming and research, we need to, we need to be thinking much harder about how we go about programming and conducting research and the position of research within programming. We need to be much more reflexive generally about what's going on, really look out for the injustices and use justice and political ecology lenses to think about distribution procedure and, and particularly procedure because of its, its you know, prolific, it's actually very hard to study and requires you know, ethnographic work and observation to really get at, at what's going on and who benefits and the interactions between those things to we need to think about diverse program intervention one of the benefits of the adaptation project in tanzania was that it was so diverse in its operations in the various activities so some of the trade-offs felt on one aspect of the project were outweighed by the participation of that person in a different activity so there was support each of the activities were, were sort of self-supporting each other so there was significantly less unintended consequences because of that diversity in the program. Um, 
these programs need to be longer in duration. It's no good that they're pilot projects because what is a pilot? A pilot is for learning. But if the funding ends at the end of the project, all that valuable learning disappears. And in all of the cases, the projects were pilot projects in some ways with three or four or five year, five year programs. If we think about, I just want to move on lastly to finish with research. I think we need to re negotiate, researchers need to negotiate a more central position for social science research and environment development practice. And that's certainly what I've been, you know, working towards. And that really is challenging because some of the, the work you present or you, you, some of the findings you find are not necessarily comfortable for the, for the organisations that you're working alongside. But you know, through long term relationships and, and learning, there is a negotiation, there is potential to create opportunities for learning and programme development. And certainly that's, that's something I, I'd like to talk more about if anyone's interested. Um, action based learning, we need to think harder about emancipatory processes, these procedural dimensions to resilience particularly given this push and the vast amounts of resources that are going into resilience planning, we need to think about the process, not just the outcomes, the delivery of resilient livelihoods or resilient landscapes. We need to think about the processes to achieving that and how just they are in terms of procedure and power dynamics, how we navigate that. We need more engaged transdisciplinarity. We need to be working with the communities and sustaining our relationships with those communities over time. So you need presence and place really matters. Strong intersectionality. We need to think about who's affected, who's benefiting and who's losing, but in more nuanced ways. We need to dig into intersectionality and how you know, aspects of marginalizations are interacting and playing out to affect how people are affected. And that requires engage, you know, deep engagement and deep engaged research. We need to think reflectively. We need to encourage reflection within development practice. We need to be applying mixed methods. We can't just um, collect household survey data without some qualitative data to try and get at the whys of what's happening. And we perhaps need to work together with communities in participatory ways to develop suitable and locally informed metrics. And that's something that Robin Loveridge has been doing in relation to driving local indicators of human well-being. So lastly, just to finish then, the acknowledgements to the projects that I've been working on and also to the, all the researchers that I've been working with and their thanks for allowing me to to present the work. Thank you very much, Susanna, for this really nice presentation. We'll now open the floor for question, discussion, comments, etc. So if you, I will start with a question of my own so that people have time to write questions in the chat. So please do go ahead and write questions in the chat. In the meantime, I just wanted to reflect on your typology of three types of injustices, procedural you talk about ways forward, and I was wondering, in terms of way forward, to what extent do you think these three types of injustices are co-determined? And in terms of strategy, is it a matter of trying to minimize all of these dimensions of injustices simultaneously, or can you work or specifically one by one by blocks, if you like? Can, can projects try to focus particularly on minimizing one type of injustice? How do you go about that? Oh my goodness, that's not an easy question, is it? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think in, I think we need to think about what we, what we understand and what we don't understand about about some of the communities. I'm not sure I'm going to ask you answer you directly, but I feel like there's a lot of work to be done about procedure. So particularly in because it seems to be so influential in in terms of distribution and also recognition. It, I mean, both procedure and recognition tend to determine and affect distribution. So whose voices are heard, 
who's represented. And those, so procedure and recognition tend to interact in really interesting ways. And I think we need to better understand that and how it's so very contextual and determined by history and governance structures in place in the particular village or region or country context. It's so very distinct and different. So a lot more research needs to be done. So I think we know a lot more about distribution than we know about procedure and recognition. And I think also the, the partners we're working with, similarly, but, you know, they, they have very detailed understanding of these challenges. But I think, yeah, I mean, maybe, I think Nike's present actually, who works for the Tanz Tanzania Forest Conservation Group, maybe she will have some sense of this and we can discuss later, but I think, I think much more work needs to be done around procedure and recognition, but it's a more challenging thing to get at because it requires, you know, long-term presence, observation, ethnographic work. That's actually very difficult to fund over the long term. Yeah, I'm not sure I answered the question. <laughs> well, it's, it does. Thank you. We've also had a question from Jonathan who says, in your experience, are there any incentives for genuine reflexivity or learning for donor funding project organizers? And do you see room for changing approaches based on reflections in the current models of action being promoted? Yeah, it's challenging. I think there is a lot of interest in reflection. And certainly when I engage with the NGO partners on the ground, we, we're talking to care at the moment around about gender particular, particularly in, and their approaches to evaluate their programming around gender but also all the partners I've worked with have a gen genuine interest in learning and I think would acknowledge that current evaluation processes are the best that can be done with the resources that are available but that sort of I suppose insufficient resources are put to the evaluation but the challenge comes, you put money to, to evaluation, but you lose money for implementation. So there's, there's challenges. So under the current structures, there are challenges within, with the donor, the donors determining what gets funded and what doesn't and how. So yeah, so I think there's a lot of discussion within the donors. So I, think, I don't think there's any shortage of willingness to learn and, and to collaborate with researchers amongst the implementing partners. I think more challenging is influencing the donors. Okay. But maybe that's some, just because I, I haven't spent enough time doing that, but I think we do as researchers. Thank you very much. One more question from um, Christine, who says, given the increasing focus on funding adaptation, how can we ensure that emerging programs embed the process of building resilience in the projects? Are there indicators that project can use for process that would better reflect process than just something like X percent of women participated in the project, for example? Yeah, I think this is where the, the work needs to go to find ways in which we can meaningfully talk about what are social science concepts and qualitative issues and that's very hard isn't it I mean certainly Robin's work to sort of devise locally suitable indicators for well-being is one option but it's still not it's not you know if you if you have to do that for every single project that's really really challenging and and, and it requires resources but I think if indicators are so important, we need to be informing those indicators with things that me are meaningful to people on the ground. So there is a need to think about, you know, statistical robustness in terms of evaluation, but also what is locally appropriate and locally, locally makes sense. Um, so yeah, so I think co-design, not only in the programming, but in the evaluation is really important and engaging communities in that evaluation. Yeah, thank you. So uh, that actually links quite well to the next question from Matt, who was asking about your thoughts on the politics of local knowledge and specifically about how to go beyond just integrating local knowledge 
to think more in terms of plural context. So that links quite well with, with your previous response. So what, what would be your thoughts on that? The politics of local knowledge. I mean, certainly there's, you know, <laughs> what is local, what is not local, what is hybrid. I mean, I, I, I don't know how to respond really. Ugh, difficult question. <laughs> I think there, you know, there is a politics of local knowledge. Just you, you can't get rid of the politics and the power at all from from local from local context, from any context. I think recognizing plurality, and I think that's something I probably rushed over at the end. If I just go back, you know, recognizing the plurality of knowledge that that people understand nature and society relationships in, di in extremely different ways to perhaps a researcher coming in from, from the University of Leeds or from a project implementing party. I think the own, you know, the own, and that's, I think, where there's, there's benefits of thinking about resilience as negotiation. And I'm not sure I'm answering this question particularly well, but I think there is a lot of potential for thinking about how how we engage you know how we engage in dialogue a lot more than we are at the moment but it requires immersing oneself in those contexts which of course is very difficult right now of course and do you know there has been maybe through ethnography work this was the second part of, of the question of matt who was also asking was there any field work that was actually focusing on understanding how uh, local populations conceptualize resilience or notions such as adaptation or, or justice. Yes. So do you have any insights on the local point of views on these concepts? Yes, actually, Marta's um, first paper that's, that's, that's drafted at the moment, she's been on maternity leave, but her first paper does talk about narrat narratives and discourse that are within the communities. And it, it links to the, one of the slides I presented around recognition that, and there's sort of, yeah, the, the differences between the conservation organizations in terms of the way they perceive the challenges compared to the communities themselves in terms of adaptation and what their priorities might be versus what was being implemented, for example. So yes, we've done some, some good ethnographic work on that. So Marta was, was present in the communities for quite a long time. Yeah, thank you. I have one more question. This one is probably much easier to answer, but you've, you've mentioned negative project evaluations here and there. So could you just tell us, uh, practically speaking, what happens when a negative project evaluation comes out? How do, how do you go about this? What is being done about it? Is there feedback? Yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily say call it a negative project evaluation. I just think perhaps they are they're framed in a in a way that is expected. So an evaluator will be consulted into a project or the evaluations. So there, there's there's different types of evaluation. You have project specific evaluation that might involve monitoring project activities that's done by the project and the project officer on the program. But then you also have independent external evaluation going on within the projects from a consultant or from, from someone representing the donor, for example. Now, those flying in and flying out are only going to get a snippet of information about the project and how it's being implemented. And of course, when they fly into a village, you know, they might be covering several villages in one day and conducting interviews or focus group meetings with participants of the project, they wouldn't have time to, to speak to those who are not involved in the project. It just wouldn't be feasible. So there's information being missed. So within the project itself, that's where there's opportunities to collect more of that information. But I think, you know, so I, I think there's, there's challenges in, in evaluation, in developing the real story, particularly if the evaluations are dependent on quantitative only measures which is the benefits of having you know participating with researchers alongside the implementation of a project there's potential for 
more learning to take place and more dialogue to take place about the challenges that are being faced and what that means for design for for other projects so i hope i'm kind of mm -hmm. yeah 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 absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we've also had a comment from uh, from nike who says that i mean some of the issues you've raised also have more to do perhaps with limited resources rather than lack of understanding or yeah. problems addressing environmental issues as such. And he mentions that given limited resources, trade-offs are also inevitable and more insights on this are needed for practitioners. Also recognizing the competitive nature of securing funds for projects. Is this something you would also agree to? Yeah, absolutely. So I've worked with Nike and Nike is working with me now. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is why I'm saying, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like a, a, prob a, a problem for particular organizations or particular, I mean, obviously some organizations are better at learning than others and better at implementing projects than others, but it's, it, there are restrictions that are on these organizations and their teams in terms of the implementation of these pro projects. I mean, the, the adaptation project itself, you know, the amount of work they managed to achieve with the resources was absolutely ridiculous. You know, it's a really impressive work, really exciting innovations being tested and communities benefiting. But, you know, certainly there needs to be more learning around the trade-offs and what that means. And, and certainly there's learning to be done across these payment for ecosystem service projects, but also these adaptation and resilience projects. So what we need to be cautious of is that projects aren't just talked about as resilience projects. They're actually building on these resilience projects are building on the legacies of these other environment development projects that were not framed around resilience, but all very much speak to each other. So there's a lot of learning to be done across these programs. So actually, in some ways, the COVID situation is important, has been an important time because it's allowing us to think across programs and, and for what, what does this mean for resilience building projects and try and do some of this systematic review type work and collation of case study type work that's, that's been going on. Many thanks. So that's, that brings our time to, to an end. So I would like to thank you um, again, Susanna, for taking part in our virtual dialogue and thank everyone for interesting comments and questions. Before we um, close off for today, I would like to remind everyone that if you'd like to know more about our events, you can sign up for our newsletter. The link is up in the chat. And I would also like to mention that we have a guest lecture next week with Madhura Swaminathan from Bangalore in India, from the Indian Statistical Institute that will focus on agrarian issues in India. We also have seminars coming up in Spanish and French. So if you'd like to practice those languages or polish your skills, feel free to join us for these two. Thanks again, everyone, and we wish you all a nice day. Thank you very much.